Okay, um, let's start this uh, third session today or the seventh session over the weekend uh, titled Stillness in Motion. And again, we'll start with a meditation. We'll continue the meditation that we did in the last session that is stillness in motion. So this practice is again, combining the two practices, the two main practices we're covering this weekend, the observing the thoughts and the resting in awareness. And so therefore the very much recommended to have the eyes open, resting your gaze in the space in front of you. You can either have your eyes naturally open or partially open, whichever you prefer. And again, adjusting the level of your gaze, depending on whether you're finding you're getting agitated, lower it a bit. If you're getting very dull and drowsy, elevate the gaze, even to the point of looking straight ahead. We'll begin the practice with resting in stillness. So as to establishing the foundation. So a few minutes of just resting in awareness, resting in that open, spacious stillness of awareness. And then from that basis, then we'll start to watch, observe the movements of the mind. The movements here is the thoughts. And the thoughts is generic term. So all conceptual activity. So we're observing not only thoughts, but emotions, memories, mental images, and so forth. So in this practice, we're not really paying attention to any sense objects. So we're not really paying any attention to any sounds and sensations and so forth. We're going to add, add two things here that you may find helpful to help you to get into the practice. One we've already added in the earlier practice of observing thoughts. And that is if you find in this practice that you're getting caught up in your thoughts and emotions, then you might like to try that labeling or noting. So give a name to the mental event, um, such as thought, memory, and so forth. If you're going to do this, keep it very simple and don't in your name, noting or labeling, label the contents of the mental event. So if you have a memory about something, don't label memory about something, just label the mental event itself. Very simple, very light, just sort of memory, image, thought, frustration. And that can help to get some space from the object. So you might like to try that if you're getting caught up a lot in your thoughts and emotions. And then one more thing you can do, uh, another short term strategy to help you to get into the practice. If you find that you're just completely lost in this practice, either you're just completely caught up in appearances and thoughts and distractions, or you're completely spaced out and, and not really uh, uh, understand what you're supposed to be doing then we can shift back to the body. So then instead of resting in stillness, watching the movements of the mind, what we can do is go back, rest in the stillness, and go back into the body. And from resting in stillness, observe the movements within the body. Movements in the body, of course, are the tactile sensations. So just observing the tactile sensations in the body, and that field is a non-conceptual field. So you may find that a little bit easier to observe the movements in the body than the movements in the mind. So that could be also a way to slowly get into this practice of stillness in motion. First, the motion of the body, and then later, once you're familiar with observing the movements of the body, then to observe the movements of the mind. So let's do that practice again now. We begin by establishing a good posture, preparing the body. So ideally to set the body up so that we can forget about the body, that the body does not create any interferences in our practice. So keeping the back straight and allowing the entire body to become completely relaxed.
and allowing the breathing to settle into its natural rhythm. Allowing it to flow naturally and effortlessly. and allowing the mind to come to rest. To rest in the stillness of the present moment. Simply resting in awareness itself. knowing that you're aware. And simply resting in that open, spacious stillness of awareness. And now whilst maintaining that basis in stillness, start to observe the movements of the mind. Simply watching thoughts from afar.
If you're finding that you're constantly getting caught up in your thoughts and emotions and so on, then take a step back by labeling or noting, i.e. giving a name to the mental event. And if you're still getting caught up in your thoughts, then take another step back and step back from the movements of the mind and now instead observe the movements of the body. So that is whilst resting in stillness, observe the tactile sensations within the body.
And we can bring the meditation to a close. In this session, we're going to begin by, we're going to continue where we left off in the last session in terms of looking at the stages of progress to shamatha. So we'll look at the actual achieving of shamatha and what that really means, and then what is beyond shamatha. And then we'll go back to the actual practice of stillness in motion, uh, add a little bit more to that, and we'll do the practice again, and then finish with question and answer as per normal. So in the previous session, we saw that um, this shamatha, shamatha is a particular level of concentration, is attained by progressing through the nine stages, these uh, stages we see in this windy road diagram, relying on the eight antidotes to abandon the five faults. This is accomplished through the six powers and the four mental engagements. So we saw there in the last session that we move through these nine stages by applying the eight antidotes and abandon the five faults through these six powers and four mental engagements. And we saw there that particularly at the first and second stage of progress that we are hardly on the object. It's very difficult to focus on the object and we're mostly distracted. But then slowly our mindfulness improves. And then by stage three and four, our mindfulness is getting a lot better. We can hold the object a lot better. Uh, stage three, we hold it most of the time. By stage four, we can hold the object the entire session without ever completely losing it. But what we saw there was even though we our mindfulness is getting quite good and we can hold the object quite well, the quality of our attention still needs a lot of work. There's still a lot of fragmentation in our attention and it needs to improve clarity significantly still. And so that's what we saw around the bend into stages five and six. We saw their introspection was very prominent, uh, noticing more and more subtle levels of laxity and excitation and adjusting accordingly, eliminating more and more subtle levels of laxity and excitation. And then we're getting around the bend again to stage seven, where we eliminate the final bit of subtle laxity, subtle excitation, so that when we achieve state eight, single pointed attention, all we need to do is a bit of effort to start the meditation, and then we can meditate flawlessly. And then moving on to stage nine, then the whole process becomes spontaneous, becomes effortless. And so that's where we left it off at this stage nine, attentional balance. And so here we can meditate for hours on end, flawlessly, without any hint of subtle agitation or subtle laxity and effortlessly. And it's said here that the quality of our experience is one of perfection and the mind is completely still. Um, but still we haven't achieved shamatha. So what do we need to go to go from stage nine to shamatha, which is the next part of the diagram. And here we have a quote from Panchen Losan Chiki Geltsen, who's a great 16th century uh, Tibetan master in the Gluck school. And this is coming from his uh, shamatha section of his Mahamudra text. He says, no matter how stable such concentration may be, if it is not imbued with the bliss of physical and mental pliancy, it is merely a single pointed mind of the desire realm. The desire realm is the realm that we uh, habit now. It's called the desire realm because the main driving force in our life in, in this realm of existence is desire, craving, attachment. And then he says, whereas concentration that is so imbued is said to be the mind of shamatha. So there earlier we saw in terms of these eight antidotes to abandon the five faults, then laziness is overcome initially through uh, faith in the practice that leads to aspiration, which leads to enthusiasm, putting effort into the practice. And that will lead us to this pliancy, this flexibility and serviceability of body and mind. So let's have a look at what that is and then how to achieve shamatha. So this diagram here we have is the actual achievement of shamatha, and it's also symbolizing this physical and mental pliancy. 
So here, if we uh, quote again from a great Indian master, Buddhist master, Sangha from the fifth century, he says, what is pliancy? It is a serviceability of body and mind due to the cessation of the continuum of physical and mental dysfunctions. So here in terms of uh, physical pliancy, now our body is not very flexible or serviceable. We have a lot of heaviness in the body. And also our mind is not very flexible or serviceable because we have a lot of resistance in our mind. So therefore that resistance in the mind and that heaviness in the body is what's obscuring this pliancy. And, it, and then he goes on to say, at the very beginning, when you begin the correct training, the occurrence of mental and physical pliancy and serviceability is subtle and difficult to discern. So as we're going through these stages in shamatha, we start to have a more flexible and serviceable body and mind. But initially, the, the level of uh, serviceability and pliancy is very subtle and it's very difficult for us to notice that. And he says, but though just as your mental one pointedness increases, so does your physical and mental pliancy increase. These two phenomena, mental one point, pointedness and pliancy are based upon each other and are dependent upon each other, which means that as we progress through these nine stages and we develop better and better attention skills, then as a side effect of that, then we automatically start to have a more flexible and serviceable body and mind. So let's have a look at the actual process of achieving shamatha. And for this, it's very nicely described in Attention Revolution from Alan Wallace on page 155. So I'll read out what he says. And this is coming from uh, actually originally from Asanga and in the same text of Asanga, he also describes it, um, this process. So here in Attention Revolution, he says, following the realization of the ninth stage of attentional balance, you are primed to achieve shamatha. The nine preceding stages entail many incremental changes, but the actual accomplishment, accomplishment of shamatha involves a radical transition in your body and mind. You will be like a butterfly emerging from its cocoon. This shift is characterized by specific experiences that take place within a discrete, relatively brief period of time. According to accounts from the Indo-Tibetan tradition of Buddhism, the first sign of the achievement of shamatha is the experience of a sense of heaviness and numbness on the top of the head. This allegedly happens to anyone who experiences this transition, regardless of the specific method followed. It is said to feel as if a palm were being placed on the top of your head. It is not unpleasant or harmful, just unusual. Something remarkable must be taking place in the cortical region of your brain at this point, but so far no one has monitored the brain correlates of this shift using magnetic resonance imaging or an electroencephalograph. This physical sensation on the top of the head is symptomatic of a shift in your nervous system or network of vital energies that is correlated with gaining freedom from mental dysfunction a general state of mental imbalance characterized by stiffness, rigidity, and unwieldiness. Consequently, you achieve a state of mental pliancy in which your mind is fit and supple like never before. From a contemplative perspective, when the mind is dysfunctional or prone to laxity and excitation, it is hard to generate enthusiasm for healing the afflictions of your mind or for devoting yourself to virtuous mental activity. Once you are free of such mental dysfunction, you can focus your mind without resistance on any meaningful object or task. And such a mind is now said to be fit or serviceable. This is the key to achieving optimal mental performance. And so here, this mental pliancy is symbolized by the meditator riding on the elephant of the mind, meaning that we can turn our attention, we can turn our mind to whatever we want without any resistance whatsoever. And then he goes on to say, following this sense of pressure on the top of your head, you experience the movement of vital energies moving in your body. And when they have coursed everywhere throughout your body, 
you feel as if you are filled with the power of this dynamic energy. You are now freed of physical dysfunction. So your body feels buoyant and light like never before. So that's symbolized here by the meditator flying through the sky. This is symbolizing physical pliancy. It's said that when we achieve shamatha, that our body feels light like cotton. And then going on, he says, both your body and mind are now imbued with an exceptional degree of pliancy, which makes them remarkably fit for engaging in all kinds of mental training and other meaningful activities. When physical pliancy initially arises, the vital energies catalyze an extraordinary sense of physical bliss, which then triggers an equally exceptional experience of mental bliss. This rush of physical or mental rapture is transient, which is a good thing, for it so captivates the attention that you can do little else except enjoy it. Gradually it subsides and you are freed from the turbulence caused by this intense joy. Your attention settles down in perfect stability and vividness. You have now achieved shamatha. Sounds pretty good, but what happens after we achieve shamatha? Is this, do we only have this in meditation? What, what are the sort of the trait effects, the residual effects of having achieved shamatha? And so here we have a, a quote from Tsongkhapa, who's sort of the founder, he's the founder of the Galuk school of Tibetan Buddhism. And he says um, in the shamatha part of his text, he says, Moreover, in post meditative experience, the occurrence of mental afflictions, such as hatred, is also utterly different than before. Being feeble and incapable of being very prolonged. So what you will notice, and you'll notice this even well before achieving shamatha, it's incremental, that the further we go in this shamatha training, then, and the deeper we get into the practice, what you will notice is outside of meditation that your mental afflictions such as craving, attachment, jealousy, anger, and so forth, uh, won't be as strong as before. And when they rise, um, they, they don't last as long as before. So certainly when we achieve shamatha, you'll find as a result of a residual effect of that shamatha is that it's, very, it's quite difficult for mental afflictions to arise. And if they arise, they're quite weak and they don't last very long at all. And then he goes on to say, the, oh, and by the way, of course, we haven't, shamatha doesn't eliminate mental afflictions, but due to though that attention skills of having that supremely calm, clear, focused mind, that mind is able to sort of really keep the lid on the mental afflictions, to subdue them, to avoid them from manifesting. They're still there, but it's harder for them to manifest um, and they manifest for a shorter time and less strong. And then he says, the sense of clarity is so great that you feel that you could count the atoms of the pillars and walls of your house. And due to deep attentional stability, sleep does not occur as it did prior to achieving Samadhi. Rather, you feel as if your sleep was suffused with samadhi and many pure dream appearances take place. And then he says, for the most part, the five obscurations do not occur. These five obscurations are sometimes also called the five hindrances and they are what obscure or what hinder us from achieving concentration, from achieving samadhi. And we've listed them here at the bottom, uh, hedonic craving, malice, then laxity paired with dullness, excitation paired with anxiety, and afflictive uncertainty. So these are things that if we have them, they are going to obstruct us from achieving shamatha, from achieving samadhi. Once we achieve shamatha, then these are uh, uh, suppressed. Well, not suppressed, they are, again, they don't manifest. We haven't really eliminated them, but they won't arise due to the power of the samadhi. And then he says, when one arises from meditative equipoise, one still possesses some degree of physical or mental pliancy. So there is some residual flexibility and serviceability of body and mind that 
continues outside of meditation. So these are some of the side effects of shamatha outside of meditation. So let's have a look at now beyond shamatha. What do we do after shamatha? One thing we can do, um, and this is described in many of the Buddhist texts, is we can actually develop much higher levels of concentration or samadhi. So we had the, initially we had those nine stages to shamatha. And whilst we're moving through those nine stages, then our mind is within this realm that we inhabit now called the desire realm. But when we actually achieve shamatha, our mind transcends that and our mind enters into what's called the form realm. It's a much more a subtle realm of existence mentally. Physically, of course, we're still here, but mentally we've gone into a higher realm once while we're in that shamatha experience. And we've become free of those five obscurations temporarily, of course, we haven't eliminated them. To eliminate the obscurations, particularly things like craving, attachment, malice, and so forth, we need Vipassana to do that. And we'll talk about that shortly. But then in the Theravada Buddhist traditions, when they talk about this concentration or Samadhi practice, they're often emphasizing higher levels of concentration than shamatha. They talk about these jhanas, which there are four levels of them. We see here first, second, third, and fourth jhana. So they emphasize a lot um, to cultivate these levels of concentration. And as we go up these higher levels of concentration, we gain freedom from more and more subtle imbalances of the mind. First, mental unhappiness, then investigation, examination, and then even bliss by the third jhana is a little bit agitating the mind. We eliminate that. And in the fourth jhana, we even eliminate happiness feeling. And we just have this pure equanimity feeling at the fourth jhana. But then we can even go much higher. Um, there are another four levels of concentration called the four levels of samapati. Uh, and in that is a much higher realm of existence. Uh, it's, it's called the formless realm. Now, at the time of the Buddha, it was felt that this was the way to get out of samsara, to get out of suffering, is that by developing higher and higher levels of samadhi, somehow we would be able to eliminate all mental afflictions and suffering. But what the Buddha discovered was that these higher levels of concentration are quite effective in temporarily keeping the lid on the mental afflictions and therefore suffering. But it's a temporary state. It, it's not liberating us from suffering at all. What he discovered was that we have to engage in Vipassana practice. And so that's what we see in the top end of this color chart. We have the shamatha there, but then right in the top right hand corner, we actually have the Vipassana practice. And so we see there the um, meditator in their right hand is a sword. This is a sword of wisdom. And then we have a lot of two lots of writing there, which we see translated the bottom here. It says, the root of samsara is cut by the union of shamatha and vipassana observing emptiness. So therefore equipped with mindfulness and introspection, seek the correct view of emptiness. Which means that um, if we, the, what we want to do beyond shamatha is that shamatha is the basis of vipassana. So on the basis of shamatha, we can engage in Vipassana practice. We can come to realize emptiness. And by coming to realize emptiness directly, we can uh, eliminate our distorted view of reality, thereby eliminate all mental afflictions and suffering and, and achieve liberation, achieve that genuine happiness. Now, what this doesn't mean is that first we need to achieve shamatha before we begin Vipassana practice. <laughs> if we do that, we'll be waiting a long time before we start any Vipassana practice. What it does mean though, is that without some shamatha practice, then Vipassana practice is not really going to be very effective. Because if we've done no shamatha practice and our mind is completely distracted and dull, and then we try to, using that mind, we try to investigate nature of reality, I don't think we're going to come to any sorts of insights because we're just going to be caught up in dullness and distraction. So therefore, what's recommended is, particularly if our attention skills now are quite poorly developed, is initially emphasize shamatha practice, put effort into shamatha practice, start to move along these nine stages to develop a more stable and more clear mind. 
Once our mind has become a little bit more stable and clear, then we can start doing Vipassana practice. And then if we start to have a little bit of an experience of nature of reality through Vipassana practice, then that's also going to start to subdue a little bit the mental afflictions, which means that will feed back into shamatha practice, that will provide better conditions for shamatha practice, so that will reinforce the shamatha practice. And then eventually, shamatha and vipassana will become unified. So it's through a union of shamatha and vipassana, uh, observing emptiness, that we can cut the root of samsara, we can cut that distorted view, thereby overcome mental afflictions and suffering. So this is, uh, from a Buddhist perspective, the main purpose of shamatha practice, to be the basis of Vipassana practice. And it's the, as we saw earlier, it's the uh, key, the gateway to genuine happiness. So let's go back now to the practice, the stillness in motion practice, and we'll uh, tweak it a little bit more. We'll add a little bit more to the practice to help us to get into the practice a little bit better. So again, as before, the, the, have the eyes open, adjusting the gaze, depending on uh, whether we're getting dull or distracted. And again, we'll start with the basis of resting in stillness. And then from that basis, start to observe the movements of the mind. And like all the shamatha practices, if we start to get a little bit distracted, then relax, release, return. If we get a little bit dull, refresh, restore, retain. So adjusting our focus if we're getting a little bit dull, a little bit distracted. But then we can have a complete spectrum of practice. What I mean by that is that at the two ends of the spectrum, at one end we have observing thoughts. At the other end, resting in awareness. And so in stillness in motion, we're right in the middle. We are resting in stillness at the same time, observing the movements of the mind. So we're equal emphasis on stillness and movement. So we're sort of in the middle of the spectrum. If you find that you are starting to get much more distracted, then it's a little bit like a, a slide along this spectrum. Now we're right in the middle. We have equal emphasis on stillness and movement. But if you find that you're constantly getting caught up in the distraction, then move the slide down towards stillness more, meaning place more emphasis on stillness and less on movement. So mainly focus, mainly rest in awareness, and a little bit in sort of the background, notice the movements of the mind. So then we can shift the emphasis. Or alternatively, if you're finding that you're just getting caught up in a lot of dullness and drowsiness, then shift the slider the other way, meaning more towards movement, meaning pay closer attention to the movement, and that will help to overcome the laxity. So we can adjust the emphasis on stillness and movement depending on whether we're getting dull or distracted. And as we did in the last meditation, if you find yourself then that that's not really working very well and you're just completely lost in this practice, you're just completely caught up in distractions or you're completely sort of blank or spaced out and not uh, really aware of anything, then step back even further. So shift back into the body. So then go back into the stillness. Once again, establish the basis of resting in stillness of awareness and now, instead of observing the movements of the mind, observe the movements of the body, meaning the tactile sensations in the body. And you'll probably find that's going to be a little bit easier to focus on because the tactile sensations are a non-conceptual field, whereas the thoughts are conceptual and it's much easier to get caught up in. So therefore, um, if you can't really get into this stillness in motion practice, then go back there and just start with stillness in motion in terms of the movements of the body. And then, then after some time, then later we can go into looking at the move, uh, observing the movements of the mind. So let's do that practice again.
setting the body into a state of relaxation, stillness, and vigilance. and relaxing more deeply with each out-breath. And with each outbreath, letting go of any thoughts that may have arisen, happily releasing them. And allowing the mind to come to rest in the present moment. Resting in stillness. Simply resting in that open, spacious stillness of awareness. Now, whilst continuing to rest in that stillness, start to observe the movements of the mind. Watching thoughts from afar.
And if you're finding that you're constantly getting caught up in, in your thoughts and getting distracted, then place more emphasis on stillness. So mainly rest in stillness and then just a little bit in the corner of the mind, in the background, notice the movements of the mind. or if you find yourself constantly falling into dullness or drowsiness, then place more emphasis on movement. That is, pay closer attention to the movements of the mind, to your thoughts and emotions, and less to stillness. And if you're completely lost in this practice, then take a step back into the body. And whilst resting in stillness, observe the movements of the body. That is, simply observe the tactile sensations within the body.
We can bring the meditation to a close. So we've got some time for question answer now. So does anyone have any questions? It can be about um, any of the topics that we've covered in this weekend retreat because uh, we've only got one more session left and it probably may not be a lot of time for Q&A in that session. So any questions you have about anything from this session or an earlier session in this weekend's retreat? Uh, I have a question, if I can ask. Sure. Um, so we are uh, we're using these three, three different objects um, of uh, of engagement three objects of, of meditation but to me it's uh, the the observation of the mind is always closely connected with an observation of the body to me it's, it's difficult to to observe the, the the movements of the mind without it also being and an observation of what's going on in the body. Could you elaborate a little bit on this sure. connection between sure. the two? Sure. Yes, you're right. I mean, of course, there's a very close relationship between body and mind and both influence the other. You know, we have some physical effect in the body and that can have a mental effect. You know, like if we put some drugs and alcohol in the body, that definitely has a big impact on the mind. And then of course, we only have to look it out when we get angry or so forth how much of a detrimental impact it has on the body. And of course, if fear arises, anything arises, there's a very strong correlation in the body. So there's a very strong correlation between body and mind. Um, and we're not trying to sort of somehow deny that or cut that or whatever. But what we find in, in the shamatha practice is that we're developing single pointed concentration. So we want to have a basically a, a single object of focus. If we are focusing on some a too wide a field, i.e. body and mind or everything, then our mind is too much movement between different fields. And therefore it's going to be very difficult to develop that single pointed attention. So for the purposes of shamatha training for meditation, much more effective is to narrow that down to one field, for example, the, the breath, the tactile sensations, the mind or awareness or so forth. Um, and then, of course, outside of shamatha, then in other when we're in daily life, then, of course, then to observe the 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 interactions between body and mind is going to be very, very helpful. In fact, for example, I think I mentioned earlier, um, you know, in daily life, based on particularly the shamatha practice of observing the mind and our thoughts and emotions, how we can bring that into daily life, one way we can bring that into daily life is in daily life, when some mental affliction, some emotion arises, to notice that and just observe that. Now what happens is some emotion arises, some anger, jealousy, craving arises. And before we know it, we're caught up in it and we're reacting and then it's a big mess. Whereas if we've done the shamatha practice observing the mind, then we're in the habit of observing thoughts and emotions and so forth in meditation. We can bring that into daily life. And then hopefully in daily life, when we notice some anger coming up, instead of automatically getting caught up in it, we can observe it and see, oh, look, there's some anger arising. And then instead of getting caught up in it, we can just watch it and then deal with this, respond to the situation effectively. However, the reality is that that's not even that's not so easy to do, even if we have done that shamatha practice. So what we can do as a helpful tool is when anger is coming up, if we're not able to observe it and we're getting caught up in it, shift your attention into the body and notice what's happening in the body correlated with the anger. There's probably some tightness and tension in the chest maybe some rough breathing and so forth and observe that because that is a non-conceptual field. And so it's going to be much easier to observe that 
than the mind. And that's what we did even just now in this stillness with motion practice. I said, if we can't get into the practice, we can't observe it, then shift back. And rather than observe the movements of the mind, observe the movements of the body. And so that's how in daily life we can um, work with the body and the mind together. But again, in the shamatha practice, you'll find it much more effective in shamatha practice to have a very narrow uh, field of focus of what the object is. If it's too broad, um, then you'll find because of that movement between the different fields, um, it'll be more difficult to go through the stages of shamatha. Does that sort of make any sense? Okay. Um, anyone else have any questions? Yeah, hi, Glenn. This is Atul again. Atul, yes. Hi. So I had a question on uh, resting in awareness. Mm -hmm. uh, so what I find is that uh, while the instruction says the, you need to be very relaxed to be able to do it, right? the more effort you put in, the more difficult it becomes. But uh, when I do the practice, I notice a subtle amount of effort to stay in the stillness. And it's not an overt effort. There's just as if the mind is working a little, little bit to stay in that space. Uh, and it's not really awareness resting by itself, you know, so the, that distinction. So how do we really get to that space? Because hmm. there does, it does feel like subtle effort, sure. uh, which sure. is not and easy to get rid of. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's correct. I mean, uh, in the beginning stages, as we saw, particularly in that nine stage chart, you know, the flame is very big at the bottom, meaning we need to put a lot of effort because the reality is, is our mindfulness and introspection are not very well developed. And so also in resting in awareness, we need to use mindfulness and introspection as the tools for that practice. So we will need to uh, put some effort but what I was trying to really, it's the beginning stages. So there will be that subtlety of effort. And what we saw was that in that nine stage chart, it's only at the very high levels that it becomes completely effortless. But what I was trying to um, emphasize with the resting in awareness practice is that we tend to, when we apply effort, we tend to tense. And when we, if we do that in the resting and awareness practice, then we're going to be popping out of it immediately. So it's really just to, even though we will, of course, need some effort to remain in that awareness, because we need to be have mindfulness to be mindful of being aware and not getting distracted and introspection to notice if we're getting distracted. So we will need some effort in doing that. But to really make sure that we're completely relaxed in this practice, to really avoid any tension in this practice, because in any shamatha practice, tension is going to create problems. But even more so, since in this resting and awareness, we're really trying to get into this being mode instead of doing mode, that tension is really going to create even more problems in the resting and awareness. So I think that's okay that you notice a little bit of effort there to, to sustain that um, uh, resting in awareness. But again, just make sure it's a nice relaxed effort and no tension. Yeah, okay. thanks. Yeah. Sure. We've still got time for, I think, one or two more questions. Glenn. Selena, hi. How are you? Good, yourself? Well, thank you. Um, a very simple question. Any tips on increasing duration of time? In terms of when or how much? Practice duration. Yeah, but I mean, in terms of when is the right time to increase or how well, much both, to increase? By? Okay. Both and any tips yeah. on, you know, just based on your experience and yeah. um, people you've taught. Yeah. Um, again, one sort of one measure is when we're starting practice, um, one, one sign that we're meditating too long is, is our enthusiasm to meditate sort of tapering off at the end? If our enthusiasm to meditate is really tapering off, 
then we're really meditating too long. So then cut it short. So always quality over quantity. I mean, there's no magic number because it really depends on us as an individual, uh, our level of capacity. So I think uh, in the beginning, we can just experiment with what seems to sort of work for us in terms of meditating too long or too short. Um, and then one sign that it's time to maybe increase that, how long we meditate, is if you're finding that your normal experience in meditation is that when you finished, your normal experience is, oh, I would have liked to have done a little bit more. If that's your normal experience, that's a sign that we have capacity to do a little bit more. We're, we're still enthusiastic and we're still maintaining whatever level of uh, clarity and stability we have, we can go a little bit further. But it's always emphasizing quality over quantity. And then when we increase the amount of time we meditate um, in small increments, usually sort of three to five minutes. So if we're say meditating 20 minutes, and then after some time, we feel like we'd like to do a bit more Then not like 20 to 40 minutes, but like maybe 23 minutes or 25 minutes. So in small increments. And as a beginner, it's always best to use a timer for a couple of reasons. Uh, if we don't use the timer as a beginner, then what often happens is some mornings we sit down to meditate and our mind is maybe agitated. It's, it's really not in a very good state. We sit down to try and meditate. We try, we try five or 10 minutes, and then we just give up because it's not working and, and we stop. And so that's not a good thing to do because uh, like everything in life, if we, whenever we're faced with difficulties, if we give up, we're not going to, we're not going to develop in anything. We need to develop persistence, you know, in the face of difficulties. So if you set a timer, then on the mornings where things are a little bit difficult, we're going to persevere in the face of difficulty. So that's good. And the other thing that often happens is if we don't use a timer is on other days, we sit down, we meditate, things are going really well and go, oh, that's nice. And so what do we do? We keep meditating and we keep meditating until when? Until it's not going so well and then we stop. And the thing we remember most about meditation is how it ended. So if we're always ending on a sort of a bad note, we're going to start to associate meditation with not such good experiences. We're not going to be enthusiastic to meditate again the following day. However, if we've set a timer, it's going well and we stop, we remember that, and then we'll be very enthusiastic to meditate the next day. I mean, I've even seen in a meditation text, one of the original meditation texts, is they even say, as soon as you see that your meditation is going well, stop. Stop. So, you know, that's an indication. I mean, it's not saying that, <laughs> I mean, we want to understand what that means. But what it's really meaning is, I think what it's trying to point is trying to put forward is that, is if we really stop when things are going well, that's going to really keep maintaining our enthusiasm to continue to meditate. And then one more thing that, maybe you might find useful and other people find useful is then, you know, once we've sort of got into meditation for a while and we have a sort of a routine and, and maybe a certain amount of time we meditate, then, um, you know, and we're using a, say a timer, then I think on occasion, it could be useful if the meditation's going well, when the timer goes off, keep meditating keep meditating just to see, just to like test the water, um, how things are going. Because sometimes you may have like a peak experience and if you, you let it go a little bit longer, you may get some sort of insight or breakthrough or something. So what I'm suggesting is if you're using a timer to be maybe a little bit flexible on that, is that, you know, not just say, okay, every time I'm gonna stop. I mean, that's the normal, but then I would, maybe it's helpful on occasion if things are going really well, just see what happens. Just let it go and just see what happens, where it takes you. Um, so that can be very useful as well. So that's a few things. And then of course, when we get deeper into the practice, then I think the timer we won't need because I think once we really get much further into practice, 
um, then we just use our own experience in terms of how long to meditate. But I think as a beginner for these reasons, it can be very helpful to set a timer. And also if we want to meditate longer in the morning, but we really can't sustain it, maybe we want to meditate 30 minutes or 45 minutes in the morning, but we really can't sustain it that long, then break the session into two or even three shorter chunks and set the timer and then have a little like one or two minute break. So maybe do 20 minutes, two minute break, another 20 minutes or 15 minutes, two minute break, 15 minutes, two minute break, 15 minutes. So always emphasizing quality over quantity. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Elena. Okay, I think it's um, time for a break now. So let's take a break for half an hour, 30 minutes. We'll come back and in the last session, we're going to look at um, integrating into daily life. In particular, we'll look at prerequisites. We'll talk about worldview and uh, how to set up our day uh, based on this practice here. So those are some of the topics for the next session. So see you back in 30 minutes.